All right, folks, let's get started. How do we answer the question, is a stock market crash coming? What you're getting to see here is my thought process, which I share with students in our analyst program on how to think about gathering information and determining if the market is going to move to the downside or if the market is gonna to move to the upside and what valuation metrics, what type of guidelines we can look at or process we can apply to help us answer that question in a logical, methodical way so that we can adjust our portfolio and we can protect ourselves from the downside or capitalize on it by shorting and also capitalize any move to the upside if the information, if our analysis gives us the conclusion that we, are, we have hit a market bottom and we're gonna move to the upside. So how do we answer that question? So let's, let's get to it so that you can see some information, some metrics that you can perhaps learn and apply yourself at home to perhaps answer that question and remove all of the noise that you're seeing in the news and the hysteria, but you can have a disciplined methodology. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first thing I wanna show is Warren Buffett. Over the weekend, I came across an article where he said he doesn't see anything of value right now. In other words, companies and valuations are not cheap enough. And this is meanwhile, Berkshire Hathaway has $137 billion in cash sitting in, the, in their balance sheet. That's a stockpile of money. And he doesn't find anything that is cheap or reasonable enough for him to buy. So then that got me thinking, what is he looking at? What is he paying attention to, to make that conclusion? And a lot of people are telling him, hey, when are you gonna deploy that capital? They're putting pressure on perhaps one of the greatest investors of all time. And of course, one of the most famous investors of all time, but he's telling the investor community, he's telling the public, not so fast. I don't see anything that's cheap. Another interesting piece of information that I came across was him saying he exited all of his positions in the airline sector, i.e. he sold all of his stocks. He has no exposure to the airline industry. So then you have to look at the, end, at the airline industry and pay close attention to the fundamental drivers of that industry. Are they intact? Are they broken? Do they have any sense of support to get them through this very tough period that we are experiencing here due to the coronavirus. And as of right now, the fundamentals of, that air, of the airline industry don't support a strong business model right now. It doesn't support a booming period for them. It's in the contrary, they're actually suffering. It is a depressionary situation or environment that the airline industry is currently being faced with. So I wouldn't be surprised if the in the upcoming months you begin to see some airlines actually filing for bankruptcy. Uh, that might be a scenario that we might be looking at. But let's go back a little bit and, and focus more on what Warren Buffett was saying. He doesn't find anything that is reasonable or cheap enough for him to go out and deploy his capital and make acquisition. So what is he paying attention to? Now, we begin to better understand how to apply valuation methodologies to answer that question or maybe view it from his perspective. So that leads me to talk about the Buffett indicator. So one of the main valuation metrics or indicators that he looks at is total market value divided by GDP or what portion of the stock market is GDP. Is it above GDP value or is it below GDP value? So essentially a ratio of one means that your total market value is equals to the US GDP size of the economy. Okay, and of course you could do your own Google research. You could find this online just to get yourself a little bit more familiar. But here's what's interesting on this ratio. When you look at what happened in the two previous bubbles, the dot-com bubble, the housing bubble, look where the ratio was at. Here, we can see it's roughly almost at 1.6, okay? The housing bubble was approximately, uh, we can say 1.8. And after those bubble bursts, look where the multiple or the, the ratio, I should say, contracted to below one. Historically, this ratio is 
around 70% or 0.7. So the question then becomes, is this what Warren Buffett paying close attention to? Is this what other big fundamental based investors are paying attention to? And are they waiting for a contraction in this ratio so where it would take it down to at least 0.8 or historical levels 0.7 and what is the main catalyst that is putting the pieces in motion for that scenario to play out well of course is the coronavirus which has disrupted the entire u.s economy the way we live and essentially just shut down businesses the economy uh and so many other parts of our day-to-day -day life that is the major disruptor of our time and if we begin to think will the same scenario play out and then what would happen if market value to gdp equals to one or below one how much are we going to lose in the stock market? What percentage of a decline can we experience? And what does that equate into dollar terms? So those are two questions that we need to answer ourselves. So here's the process that I apply, which again, you can do this on your own at home, but I wanna share that process so that you can learn a little bit more on what I'm actually doing. And of course, what we are showing to students in our analyst program. So this next slide, leads me to anticipate a market value of 16.7 trillion if the total market value to GDP ratio is 0.8. The stock market value would decline to 16.7 trillion. That's a 40% decline. And it equates to a loss of $11 trillion. Think about that. $11 trillion wiped out of the stock market because we probably are overinflated and the loss of revenue, the amount of debt that is not going to be serviced, the amount of debt that has to be wiped out, the amount of job that has been lost in the economy, purchasing power, it is astronomical. And we can probably measure it in this form. This is one of the ways that we can look at the potential economic value in the overall economy. We can look at it by measuring the stock market. And in this case, you can see it's $11 trillion of potential loss. Now, where are we at right now in terms of this ratio? You can see right here, we are at 135, or you could say 1.35, or I say percentage terms, 135. That's where we at. And if we contract to 80%, this is what you're seeing right here. 16.7 trillion i mean it's, it's just an astronomical number and the value of the stock market you can see here on the right chart and by the way this is provided by girl focus so you could go to the website and look at this analysis yourself to validate if this makes sense or if it doesn't make sense and then you can draw your own conclusion first you need to understand the methodology the metrics the valuation and then you can apply it and you make your own assessment, analyze it, and draw your own conclusion. It's about knowing the process. So we are about $28 trillion. And if we do contract, I mean, he, here's again where it's taking you. It's, it's quite interesting and, and it's also fearful when you really begin to look at the size of potential loss. So that's number one, looking at the Buffett ratio, total stock market value over GDP. If we look at the previous bubbles, the housing bubble and the dot-com bubble, what can potentially happen to the market? Do we have a, another wave to the upside or do we have another wave or leg to the downside? So let's examine that a little bit more carefully. So let's go here back to our slides. And here we go. So on the left-hand side, I have the dot-com bubble and on the right-hand side, we have the housing bubble. So let's start first with the dot-com bubble. The first move to the downside was 30% decline in the overall market. And when I mean the overall market, I'm referring specifically to the S&P 500. If you want exposure under the ETF, uh, ticker symbol SPY or the SPY, that's the charts that I'm referring to right here. So the first leg down was 30%. Then we follow a 21% rally or a dead cat bounce, a temporary rally in a bear market. And the second leg to the downside was 40%, much bigger than the first rally. That equated to a total market loss of 50% from peak to bottom. Now let's look at the other bubble, the housing crisis, which of course led to the financial crisis. 
The first leg to the downside, to the downside was 20%, followed by a temporary bear market rally of 14%. And then the second wave or the second leg to the downside was 53%. From top to bottom, the market lost 57%. Now, if history is any indication of things to come, and you know what they say, history always repeats itself, if we apply the same analysis to our current market, where can the market go if it experiences a second leg to the downside? So let's go ahead and do that. So here's where we are today. We of course experienced the first leg to the downside was 35%. And by the way, I may add, it was the fastest decline in history very violent, very sharp in a short period of time. And that's where you begin to see the Fed and Congress pass stimulus packages because they understand what's, what's about to happen. But after the Fed and Congress passed the bills to contain uh, any downside risk due to the coronavirus, we experienced a 34% rally. So this is a, a, a temporary rally right now that, that we're seeing. And the next move to the downside, what is it projected to be? Look at that, 53%. 53%, which could translate to $11 trillion in market value loss. Or if you wanna take the S&P 500, or just the overall stock market, uh, from where is that right now at that 34% um, rally, I think th this would equate to about $15 trillion as well. I mean, these are astronomical numbers. So from peak to bottom, you're looking at a 59% loss, and that will give you a target on the SPIs of 138. It's, it's just quite interesting how the numbers play out when you look at the dot-com bubble, the tech, uh, the, the housing bubble and the financial crisis and how the second wave, the second leg to the downside played out, which is the same thing I'm applying right here. So when we look at the bigger picture, it doesn't look pretty, right? You're starting to see the information where you begin to make the case for another leg to the downside. And that is scary. Having this information should help you make better investment decisions and also protect your portfolio for any further downside risk after experiencing a 30% rally from the, uh, the March lows. So what has happened since then, right? What fuel, what was the catalyst or the fundamental driving factor that fuel this short-term bear market rally as some investors like to think of and gave us a 34% rally? Well, it was the fast respond and the aggressive respond from Congress and the central bank. The central bank started buying junk bonds. Now they are providing more liquidity into the market and they expanded their balance sheet to $6.7 trillion. I mean, th these are big numbers. Of course, when you're looking at a market that might lose $11 trillion, yeah, is $6.7 trillion adequate liquidity, adequate firing power on the Fed's behalf to contain this? We'll have to wait and see. What about Congress? What about the federal government? What did they do? Well, of course, Trump signed that $2 trillion stimulus packages to provide a sense of relief to Americans that lost their job due to no faults of their own. They also passed another bill to provide small loans to small business owners and also mid-sized business just to help them get through this really tough period. So when you add both of these numbers up, the $2 trillion passed by Congress and the $6.7 trillion in expansion of the Fed balance sheet, that gives you around $9 to $10 trillion, let's say $10 trillion. So that's what they've done so far in order to contain a potential move to the downside and to match the potential $11 trillion loss on the stock market value. So, this is why the market has rallied. And you have people on one side of the aisle saying that we've hit the bottom. What the Fed and what the government has done, the amount of liquidity that they injected into the system is enough to contain the situation. Therefore, when the economy opens up slowly and we gradually resume a normal sense of, of uh, activity, the economy will pick up, therefore the market will gradually continue to move higher. We're gonna hit all time highs and next year we're gonna be higher than where is at today. I understand that argument and I see it. 
Then on the other side of the equation, you have other people saying, yes, I see the amount of stimulation in terms of liquidity that the Fed and the central government has injected into the economy. But wait a minute, don't get ahead of yourself so fast. You have to pay close attention now to the economic numbers that is coming down the pipeline. For example, there's about 30 million Americans right now out of work that file for jobless claims and employment uh, benefits. You have some economists straight out of JP Morgan saying that the second quarter GDP hit is gonna be 40% and he expects unemployment rate to reach 20%. You have another Fed governor saying that we might see unemployment rate at 30%. So the economic data that is coming down the pipeline, it's not gonna be good. It's actually gonna be rather bad. So what other parts of the economy will be impacted by the coronavirus that we haven't seen just yet? And that leads me to my next point, which is a potential brewing crisis in the housing market. The housing market as of 2020 was approximately $36 trillion, according to World Property Journal. And people are now saying that there is a movement where tenants are not going to pay the rent. People that have mortgages, they're probably not going to pay and service those mortgages, which is going to create some ramifications or unintended consequences in the financial uh, industry. So some of these mortgage loans that are actually traded and people own in their portfolios to collect the interest uh, payment as, as in the form of rental income, that, that market will be disrupted. Now, how big of an impact is that gonna be? Is that gonna be 5 trillion? Is that gonna be 11 trillion? There's other articles out there saying that it will probably be $11 trillion. So if that does come to fruition and we do see another major crisis in the housing market, that has the potential to create another major leg to the downside in the stock market and might cause the central bank and the government to pass more stimulus packages. That is the other argument that I'm starting to see right now from people that think we have another leg to the downside. And if this spills over, if the stock market crisis and the unemployment uh, crisis spill to the housing market, you can begin to connect the dots and, and see that, wait a minute, all of the pieces are in place to, and also set the, the, the wheels in motion for another housing crisis. And that might be another $11 trillion uh, potential loss in, in value, in wealth that the federal government and the central bank has to deal with. And they might have to inject more liquidity into the market. So this is how I view this stuff. This is how I look at some of the information and I look at all the variables, the moving pieces, and I try to connect to see what's happening in real time. So the question comes back to, if, are we going to experience another market crash? Do we have another leg to the downside like we experienced in the dot-com bubble and in the housing bubble? So that takes us back to the Warren Buffett indicator. Stock market value over GDP. As it stands right now, we are about 135. And if we contract to the historic average of 0.7 or 70%, we already know that the stock market can drop another 50% equating to $11 trillion of economic loss. And that can also spill into the housing uh, market. So there's just a, a lot of things moving in pieces right now for us to pay attention to. There's a lot of data um, and variables to consider when we are making these types of decisions based on our homework. It's your job and your responsibility to do this same level of analysis and, and with pen and paper, start drawing the numbers. Uh, who knows, validate my numbers, you know, see if I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. You know, leave your comments below. I, I would like to uh, see what you think ab about this and maybe you can have a little bit better step-by-step -step process on what key valuation metrics or, or, or measurements to look at, like Warren Buffett looks at, to help you better understand what's about to come, but more importantly, how you can protect yourself from any other downside or capitalize on any future upside in the market if we've seen the bottom. So with that being said, folks, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, again, leave your comments, subscribe. If you find value in this, give us a thumbs up and we'll continue to do more analysis like this so that you can learn a little bit more of our process. So take care and I'll see you in the next one.